Just outside Oxford is an extraordinary machine, the United Kingdom's synchrotron. Inside this massive building, electrons are accelerated to near the speed of light, creating a type of giant microscope which allows scientists to examine matter in minute detail, revealing the atomic structure of the world around us. The first solid matter known to have ever been formed was cosmic dust. Our entire solar system is made from it, but only limited amounts of it make it back here to Earth, which makes it really difficult to study. But here in the synchrotron, researchers are trying to do just that, recreating cosmic dust to ask some big old questions about the origin of life. Personally, I, I want to know where we came from. Meet senior beamline scientist Stephen Thompson. He's using the synchrotron to study the behaviour of space dust. Dust is the very original material. It's the first thing that forms. It's the first thing that formed in the history of the universe. It's the first thing that forms around a star now. It's the stuff from which everything is made, including us. And we want to understand how that behaves, how it evolves, how it got from almost satellite materials around a star to the complex, fascinating world we see around us. Around 1% of the mass of the interstellar medium within our galaxy is made up of cosmic dust. Billions and billions of tonnes of the stuff. While we know its chemical composition, we have very little available on Earth to study. So Stephen replicates it in his lab. Salts is magnesium chloride, this is sodium silicate, and one here is and iron sulphate, and I mix them together in a process known as sol gel, so sort a of gelatinous solid, which is our starting point for making our dust. And how do you know what that chemical composition is? Uh, that's been put together very carefully by astronomers who've made lots of observations of stars and analysis of things like meteorites and recovered materials. The composition of space dust is known to be a predominantly amorphous magnesium and iron silicate something that can be replicated in the lab and experimented on. I mix the chloride with the sulphate first. And when we mix them together, we get this green gelatinous material. It's a mixture of water and the gel. What we would normally do then is we'd let, either let that settle or we put it into a centrifuge. We separate the water from the gel material. We would then take the gel and we'd stick it in a microwave, an ordinary domestic microwave. That is going to completely change the way I see the microwave in my kitchen. I mean, you're actually making something that is only in outer space. We're making a model of it. It's not the actual same thing. It, obviously, there's not a microwave in space. This we would cook for about 10 minutes, and this is actually a massive improvement. Previously, we used to use this, which is a vacuum furnace. It dries the gel under vacuum. If you want to make a lot of it, it will take you a very long time. Whereas in the microwave, we can do a whole batch of different compositions in just a few minutes or over the course of one day, very quickly. And that's a big step forward. This is our final product we've just cooked. Oh, wow. Incredible. And just in 10 minutes. Just in 10 minutes. And there are billions upon billions and billions of tons of this floating around in space. Incredible. When it was first switched on, the diamond light source synchrotron became the brightest source of light in our solar system, 10 billion times brighter than the sun. The machine accelerates electrons to near light speed. This is amazing. Look at the scale of this. So Isabel, what part of the facility is this bit? This is the experimental hall and this is the storage ring. Uh, the storage ring is one of the three particle accelerators that we use to generate very brilliant beams of light. So underneath our feet right now are electrons moving around. That's right. In a vacuum pipe with um, magnets around the vacuum pipe. And actually where I'm standing here is where the electrons are, are traveling, that, that yellow line that you see. And at various points you'll see a little kind of red circle on the line and that is actually at the point at which the electrons are generating that light. What's known as a bunch, which contains billions of electrons, is generated in the electron gun and then directed into the linear accelerator. 
A small booster ring energizes the electrons before they're injected into the main storage ring. The storage ring consists of 50 straight sections angled together with powerful magnets. When the path of the electron beam is bent by the magnets, energy is lost in the form of light. The beams of light coming off are very carefully channeled down what we call here beam lines, these lorry-like containers. Most of it are yellow because they are x-rays. The white part is actually the control cabin where the scientists would be sat doing their measurements. So the section that you see in front of you all the way here is repeated 24 times in that tunnel, that half a kilometre tunnel that we stood upon earlier. So this is underneath the concrete slabs? This is actually what is beneath the concrete slabs, that's right. There are 32 beam lines that branch off from the synchrotron ring. The beam line that Stephen uses is the only long duration synchrotron facility in the world, allowing him to work using longer time frames. One of the experiments we did was to see how it reacts with humidity because there's a lot of water vapour in certain areas of space. And so what we did, we put it, designed a special chamber here, which is a humidity chamber, it's got a controlled humidity, and we put our dust here inside and we exposed it for about a year to see how that affected the properties of the dust, the structure of it, and how it evolved. And so is that what you're trying to determine then by all these experiments and all of this amazing machinery? We want to know... It, Everything around you had to come from somewhere. We want to know where that is. The dust in space is transformed by heat, gases or pressure into planets and other objects to form solar systems. Stephen hopes to gain insights into this process by applying similar forces to the cosmic dust he has created over a long period of time and analysing how its composition changes. And that's where he needs the power of the synchrotron. If you heat something, you know it changes its properties. Sometimes it changes its structure. If you heat water from ice, it goes from a solid to a liquid. Same with all materials. If you heat them or do other things to them, their internal structure reorganises and changes. And that's what we can measure with the synchrotron. How does the interaction of light meeting this space dust to give us those answers you're looking for? The light we use are x-rays, but much, much more powerful, so powerful you couldn't put a human in them. The x-rays go into the material and they bounce off the atoms inside and then scatter. And if you took a picture of that scattering, you would see a pattern. And if you analyse that pattern, you can work out the structure, how the atoms orientate themselves relative to each other. The dust in its interstellar form has a disordered structure captured here in the X-ray pattern as rings with less definition. After the application of heat, gases or pressure, the atomic arrangement transforms into a crystalline structure, which has a well-ordered internal structure which corresponds to well-defined rings in the X-ray pattern. So is the key essential part of this facility to see the structures. The structure is the key to everything. All the advances in modern technology, all the advances in pharmaceuticals, understanding how the structure behaves, the advances in batteries, life sciences, all down to structure. We really live in a materials age where structure, understanding structure is the key thing. In this beamline, a number of other projects are underway, from studying how super alloys change under extreme heat in airplane turbines, to samples of cannonballs from the Tudor shipwreck, the Mary Rose. It's such a vast space here. How significant is the scale? The size is fundamental because the larger the ring that produces the light, the brighter the light is. And, and the more powerful, the faster we can make measurements, the greater the detail with which we can reveal the structure of matter. So it might be a biologist who wants to understand the way in which the molecules of life in your body work. It could be someone who wants to develop new metals for a jet engine, all of which fundamentally require us to look at where the individual atoms are. There's so much going on here, from massive components being moved to things being fitted and fixed and recalibrated. And even though what they're working with is on a tiny scale, what they're achieving is actually massive. 
The diamond light source synchrotron is a triumph of the huge and the very small. One of only 60 such facilities in the world, it allows scientists from a range of disciplines to find answers to practical applications and to ask the really big questions like, where do we come from? So from dust you can make in a microwave, you can ask such fundamental questions using this machinery. It's amazing. You've got something, as you say, you made in a microwave, a machine as big as diamond to see something as small as an atom to tell you something about materials that form around stars that are billions and billions of miles away. It's amazing. Thank you.